Is traveling to a dark site for astrophotography worth the time and expense? Can you get better narrowband, or for that matter, broadband images from darker skies? Let's talk sensor sensibility. Most astrophotographers deal with the light pollution as a fact of life. Some occasionally pack up their equipment and travel to a dark site. No doubt that it's awe-inspiring to gaze at a star-studded black sky, but are photos taken through a dark sky that much better than photos taken back home? To address this question, we compare images of the same object taken at different sites through the same telescope. For our first test, we shot the Iris Nebula taken through our ZWO Seastar S50 telescope on its equatorial mount at five different sites in the United States of America. See the description below for a link to a sensor sensibility playlist on the construction and operation of this mount. The five sites are a Bortle 1 site in western Utah, a Bortle 2 site at Treasureton Reservoir in southern Idaho, my Bortle 4 backyard in North Logan, Utah, a Bortle 6 site in Ogden, Utah, and a Bortle 8 9 site in Washington, D.C. These approximate Bortle ratings and these maps were obtained from the website lightpollutionmap.info, which is linked in the description below. The Bortle scale measures the extent of light pollution in the sky, with Bortle 1 giving a completely dark sky and Bortle 9 giving a highly light polluted sky. I took the Bortle 8 9 data from Kenilworth Park in a dodgy neighborhood where I saw random visitors wandering by and heard gunshots during the night. Instead of sleeping in the back of the car as I usually do, I stayed awake in the driver's seat with the car locked, poised for a quick getaway if needed. Wren told me to drive away and leave our Sea Star behind if things went sideways, but luckily I didn't have to resort to that. We don't get that many visitors in Treasureton. No. We astrophotographers put it all on the line. At each site, we took 650 20 second frames of the Iris Nebula for a total integration time of 3.6 hours per site. I processed all five images in PixSight in the same Pix Insight in the same way and at the same time. Here are the five images in order of increasing light pollution, with portal numbers at the bottom of each picture. As you go from dark si skies to light polluted skies, the sky goes from black to blue gray. The nebula gets fainter and smaller, and stars disappear like roaches when you turn on the kitchen lights. Here are the Bortle 1 and Bortle 6 images with a bit more processing to darken the background and bring out the nebula. There is a big difference between those two. The iris nebula is made up of reflection and dark nebulae, which emit a broad spectrum of wavelengths. Stars and galaxies also emit broad spectra. Images of such broadband targets taken through light polluted skies are difficult to process because the bright sky background obscures fainter features of the targets, reduces the number of stars, and creates background gradients that are difficult to remove. Emission nebulae and supernova remnants, on the other hand, emit light only at specific wavelengths that can be collected through narrowband filters that pass those wavelengths and exclude all others. Such narrowband filters have revolutionized the astrophotography hobby by increasing the contrast between deep sky objects and the light polluted sky background. Ren and I are lucky to live under Bortle 4 skies, we admit it, and to have access to Bortle 2 skies a 45 minute drive away so we can image both broadband and narrowband objects. But we sometimes wonder whether it's worth the drive to our Bortle 2 site. To shed light on this question, we compare images taken from these two sites of the Andromeda Galaxy, a broadband object, and the Rosette Nebula, a narrowband object, through our CAT-91 telescope and our ASI-6200 camera. Here's an auto-stretched 60-minute stack of 20 three-minute frames of the Andromeda Galaxy taken through our Antlia V-Series luminance filter from Dad's Bortle 4 backyard under moonless skies. 
And here is an identical stack taken from our Bortle 2 site. <laughs> Just look at how much bigger and brighter the galaxy is under the Bortle 2 skies and how much darker the, back the sky background is. Further evidence of the superiority of Bortle 2 is its 66,583 stars compared with the 50,702 stars in the Bortle 4 image, as counted by PixInsight Image Solver. The background gradients that show in the Bortle 4 image can be a pain to remove in post-processing. Good data from dark skies is easier to process and produces better images. I believe you. Ren is our PixInsight expert. Here's an auto-stretched 100-minute stack of 10 10-minute 10 frames of the Rosette Nebula taken through our Antlia 2.5 nanometer ultra narrowband oxygen 3 filter, taken from my Bortle 4 backyard under moonless skies. And here's an identical stack taken from our Bortle 2 site. The Bortle 2 skies show a bigger and brighter nebula, more faint nebulosity around the nebula, a darker sky background, and 39,392 stars versus 24,624 stars, if you want to know the numbers, in the Bortle 4 image. It is surprising to me that the Bortle 2 and Bortle 4 narrowband images are so different from each other. Yeah, I was surprised as well. Many astrophotographers take great images of narrowband objects through light polluted skies, but longer in integration times may be needed to produce them. Not to mention extra work in post-processing. For us, based on our images of the Andromeda Galaxy and the Rosette Nebula, if one of us is free to image from our Bortle 2 site during New Moon, he will, regardless of whether the target's narrowband or broadband. More work for us. In conclusion, a darker sky will produce better images, and it's generally worth the trip to image from a dark side. But we astrophotographers are a resourceful bunch and find ways to make the best of our skies and our equipment. After all, Galileo made his groundbreaking discoveries using a telescope of aperture 15 millimeters, less than a centimeter, focal length 980 millimeters, and focal ratio 65. Not much light. It's insane. Like Galileo, the challenge for us is to make use of what we have to appreciate the treasures that are hidden among the stars. The description below contains links to our high resolution color astrobin images of the Andromeda Galaxy and of the Rosette Nebula, along with a link to our Cat91 First Light video, which describes these images. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.